Thus, the computer's extreme synchronization results in a more elastic form of time than we've known in the past. Now, in order to survive, every society requires a degree of synchronization from its members. For most of our history, our species worked with the rhythms of nature, such as sunrise and sunset, new moon and full moon, equinox and solstice. That was enough. When the first temporal technologies were introduced, such as the calendar and the clock, they by and large served to further control and coordinate the actions of human beings. The town clock, with its elevated fa face and its far-reaching chimes, established a local area of synchronized time that served the needs of commerce in most Western societies from the 14th century into the 19th century. The invention of the telegraph made it possible to extend this area from local to the regional in the form of time zones. And since that time, many forms of telecommunications, as well as the mass production of increasingly more accurate clocks and watches, have further enhanced coordinated action and procedures. There's a certain irony to the fact that while our technologies are highly synchronized in their use of time, our societies are still working largely with a 19th century system of timekeeping. For example, we all may be wearing extremely accurate watches, but they're all set to different times. The differences can be as much as 10, 15 minutes apart. Now the solution, if you consider this a problem, I mean, the solution has already appeared in the form of clocks and watches, VCRs and computer time displays and cable boxes and cell phones, all of which receive a kind of broadcast time and display it automatically. In fact, it re recently um, there was something in the New York Times about this, that the sale of watches has decreased significantly recently, a fact that's attributed to people using cell phones as timepieces. The watch has become obsolescent. No doubt it'll continue to be used as a form of jewelry for some time to come, but it's no longer necessary. So cyber time then is a highly synchronized time, a broadcast time, and eventually it will be a global time. I mean, ultimately I believe we'll have to be, there'll have to be a single source, a centralized world clock that will govern all cyber time keeping. And there'll have to be a single time frame to synchronize human activity on a global scale. One example has already appeared, it's Swatch. You know Swatch, the Swatch internet time. That's been broadcast from the headquarters of the watch company uh, in Switzerland since 1998. Swatch time is digital. It displays an accumulation of units called beats. It's metric time. Forget about hours and minutes, it just divides the day into 1,000 beats. The first major instance of applying, this is the first major instance of applying the metric system to time. There were some attempts to do it back during the, uh, at the time of the French Revolution, but they were very unpopular. But swatch time does not correspond to clock time, our traditional clock time, in any obvious way. For example, 9.49 p.m. in New York City is at, they use an at sign, 117 swatch time. But in a way, this makes it well suited for a 24-hour society, or as the saying goes, 24-7. And for, it makes it well suited for providing a global standard. At 117 is at 117 anywhere on Earth. Now, another system may ultimately displace swatch time, but the emergence of global standard may well actually signal the obsolescence of time zones. We may no longer need those Eastern Standard and, and Central and, uh, time zones that the world is divided into. Now, since I made cyber time my fifth bit, it seems only fair to make cyberspace my sixth bit. And the point I want to stress here is that Einstein established that physical space is relative, and in the same way, cyberspace is also a product of relationships. Cyberspace is a product of relationships between ourselves and the technology, but most importantly, it's a product of the relationship between ourselves and other human beings using that technology. The city makes it for an interesting case to consider. Mumford viewed cities as technologies, 
which is a point that we tend to overlook because we usually think of technologies as tools. We also tend to forget about container technologies, such as the Paleolithic use of skins and shells, and the Neolithic invention of pots, bowls, jars, bottles, and the like. Without container technology, specifically methods of water storage, such as irrigation and wells, as well as innovations such as barns and granaries, without that, we would not have had the agricultural revolution. And as surplus production of food created the problem of spoilage, containers provided the solution. And that, in turn, encouraged population growth and concentration. On a larger scale, other forms of container technology became possible, including fixed dwellings, houses, and permanent settlements, such as villages and cities. As the various forms of container technology made it possible for village communities to evolve into cities, so the city became the ultimate container, the container of containers. By bringing people together in one location, the tempo of human life quickened and the rate of change increased. Time sped up as it bounced off the walls of the ancient city. Urban centralization and speed made possible forms of control and coordination inconceivable in tribal cultures. This gave rise to the first machines, according to Lewis Mumford. And what Lewis Mumford meant was that the first machines were organic. They consisted of the centralized organization and coordination of human labor. Only later would the fallible, fragile human parts of the machine be replaced by more reliable artificial parts. But the first human machines were used to build great irrigation ditches, to build temples and palaces, to build monuments and pyramids. And they were used to conquer and dominate territory in the as in the form of organized military force. But what is true for physical labor also holds true for mental labor. Intellectual efforts could be centrally organized and coordinated. It therefore follows that the city is the first supercomputer, the first medium for gathering, storing, and processing information on a scale that transcends human experience. And like the electronic computer, the city computer could not function without a special, artificially constructed language, a language that would make it possible to program the city computer. What's that special lang programming language? It's writing. Writing is itself a container, a container of information and knowledge. And writing made possible city-states and imperial cities in the ancient world. Writing and notational systems also led to timekeeping and eventually to the invention of the mechanical clock. Now, while the mechanical clock was invented in the medieval monastery, its early adoption followed the patterns of 14th century urban development. The clock tower became the symbolic center of the urban landscape through most of the modern age, and it made it possible to synchronize and coordinate human activities and allowed for an even faster pace and increased complexity than ever before. Understanding the parallel between the computer as microprocessor and the city as macroprocessor suggests that electronic and digital technologies have rendered the city obsolescent, which is an observation that McLuhan made back in the 1960s. For example, consider the fast pace of city life. Given the value we place on speed, you might say that there is no city like velocity. Not only is it impossible for the city to compete with the instantaneous nature of electronic communication, but city life itself has long since reached its threshold of reversal. Traffic jams are a way of life, as residents of Mexico City know better than anybody. City dwellers may still seem rushed, but we've become quite used to waiting in lines waiting for taxis and buses, waiting for tables in restaurants, waiting for appointments, waiting, waiting, waiting. And all this waiting is accompanied by a breakdown in synchronization. As travel time in the metropolis becomes more unpredictable, the ability to arrange face-to-face -face meetings is undermined. Starting time for events becomes problematic. 
Cities have become inefficient, and cyberspace makes it possible, often preferable, for organizations and individuals to find alternatives.